Today's little project is working on this uh, Kia reel and we're just basically doing maintenance. There wasn't really a problem here. Uh, I'm not sure what year it is, but he was running on the original brakes and he just wants to get everything refreshed. So we're getting new pads and rotors up front and the same thing for the back of the car. And looking at the rear brake pads, you can see how they are tapered, especially the inside one. And on these Kias and Hyundais, what I usually found what causes this is the emergency brake cable. Because when the caliper is sitting in place, this cable applies uh, pressure to one side and it basically forces the caliper to sit at a weird angle. So not, no matter how perfect you do your brake job, how much you clean everything and just do the most perfect job you can, the pads on these cars usually tend to wear in a weird pattern like this and it's all because of the emergency brake cable applying uh, that like weird pressure on it and i know this because i used to have a hyundai and i went i fought this battle forever for years it doesn't matter what i tried as long as this cable is connected you're going to have that problem okay and just to uh, prove my point here i'm on the right side of the car and uh, you can see what i was talking about earlier how the cable comes right here and it's always applying pressure to the caliper at this corner. So what's gonna happen? It tends to push in more on the bottom left corner over here. So let's go ahead and take this caliper completely off. And let's look at the brake pads on this side. And what do you see? The same exact problem. The brake pads are tapered in towards the bottom over here. And that's because of that emergency brake cable always applying force to the caliper. Everything is completely seized because of the rust so I'm just gonna go ahead and take all this apart and chuck the caliper bracket inside of the sandblaster And that's it for this one. This Kia Rio is all set. It's ready to go and put down that 82 horsepower down to the pavement. Alright, so I'm in a Nissan Murano suspected bad alternator. That's what the owner says. But I'm out here for a test drive. Look at this interior. It's hard. It may be hard to see, but it's like... It's like they had two giant cups of soda in here and they got into a car accident or something because there is just soda all over this car. It's nasty. It's sticky inside of here. It's horrible. Wow, it's over everything. Alright, so this uh, Nissan Murano is running. Alright, so today I'm working on this wonderful piece of garbage, Nissan Murano. Um, I swear, the more I work on Nissans, the more I hate them, and I regret buying one myself. But uh, today we're doing the alternator on this Murano, and I saw a video on YouTube about, you know, moving the AC compressor, like, in the wheel well over there, which I did. And then the guy talks about how he removed the alternator from the bottom of the car. You know between the subframe and the oil pan that's not gonna happen you could fight with it for four hours try all kinds of stuff you want it's not gonna come out I don't know how that guy did it maybe witchcraft I have no idea but the radiator in this car comes out pretty easy just pull the radiator out pull the battery out you know move this stuff out of the way and then you have all this space all this space to bring the alternator out and remove it from this side and if you don't want to move it out from the top, once you get the radiator out, you can see all this space you have down here. So at this point, I don't know if I'll be able to do this one hand, but you should be able to just pull it right out of here. And there it goes. Look at that. So I pulled out this radiator 
faster than all the time I spent trying to do this method of trying to pull it out of here. That's not going to happen. It's way faster just pull the radiator out and uh, make your life easy. And to nobody's surprise, the crack pipe on this car is uh, completely rotted out. It's a real common issue on these engines. So we have a new part right here and it's just gonna go pretty much right there. All right, so I have to finish putting this uh, Murano back together, but all the main components are together. And we could see we are now charging, so it's all set. I just have to uh, finish topping off the coolant. And like I said, finish putting it back together and it's all set. Alright, so one more thing with this uh, Murano before the customer picks it up. He said there's a noise coming from the back. Uh, more specifically, it's like whenever you turn left, you hear what sounds like a CV noise. But that's something you normally hear up front because those are the wheels that turn. I'm just back here looking. One thing I did notice is the muffler. Completely broken, separated. So... You know, could this be his noise? I don't know. 2010 Ford Focus. Yeah, this wheel bearing is shot. So it's about 9 p.m. and I'm finally getting back around to this uh, Ford Focus. So oh, try to go ahead and get this drum off. Okay, so here it comes. Probably a lot easier with two hands. Completely destroyed. Thing I noticed is, uh, look at the clip here. It comes right out. So I don't know. I think I'm at the point where, let's see. I think if you buy a new drum. I think it comes with the wheel bearing already installed and we might have to take that route because the drum itself is pretty mangled up um, obviously we need brake shoes I don't have a new snap ring this one's pretty much destroyed so what to do what to do and of course it's always Customers press for money right now, so what to do, what to do. Sweet, the race that's attached here, uh, you know, so got this little puller, and it's not even on it tight. You can see it's moving, and I'm just turning it with my hand, and that's how it came off. I need two hands for this job, but it's still coming off. These bugs are attacking me out here since I got a a lamp on my head you know all the bugs are being attracted to me Ugh, god damn you <laughs> all right let me uh keep using the puller here's my game plan uh customer really doesn't have money to be replacing everything here i know the edge of this rotor or this uh drum is you know scored up but the shoe pretty much rides right here so I think we're going to run with this drum and I'm going to put it together with the new bearing but she's going to have to come back and get new brake shoes but we're going to try to run with the drum and uh, hopefully it should be okay and also I got to see if I can get a new clip. Alright so one more thing to point out uh, this job just keeps getting more and more expensive. 
uh, maybe there is no cheap way out of this one <laughs> okay so she has her ABS light on right and when I took it out for a test drive weeks ago I told her hey it's this wheel right here and it also sounds like that wheel bearing is going bad all right so now that I got it all taken apart I'm looking for the ABS sensor or the speed sensor I'm like hey I don't see it but no it's there that's it right there it's just worn down horribly it's like completely flush you could even see the cable back here for the sensor see it so what's happening is this ring and this is actually like the tone ring for the for the ABS is or was rubbing on it so bad because of the bad wheel bearing that it completely destroyed this part and the ABS sensor so she's also gonna need a sensor now and a new tone ring it just keeps getting more and more expensive nice I finally get to use my uh, new shop press besides that uh, one job that I actually bought it for so pretty sweet it's already painted itself off so I just finished torquing the main nut right here and the wheel bearing sounds nice and smooth just got off the phone with the owner of the car and she wanted to take the route of uh, put the wheel bearing on right now and she could have the car back as soon as tomorrow and she's gonna come back later on in the future to get the shoes done the ABS sensor and the magnetic uh, pickup ring tone ring whatever you want to call it you know what I'm talking about uh, the, the only thing that concerns me is the new bearing didn't it, it didn't slide right on the, the actual spindle it was kind of like a, a tight pressure fit okay um, I had to give it a few love taps with the rubber mallet to get it on and my concern is when I go to remove this to replace those other parts later on is the new bearing going to separate and fall apart so we may have to have a new bearing on hand which sucks alright I'm here with my neighbor's Elantra we went out for a test drive and he has this really loud rattle sound there in the acceleration I told him okay put it in neutral and see, see if it still does it and it still does it okay so it's engine related uh, I told him let's get out let's take the serpentine belt off and see if the noise goes away I took the belt off and the noise is still there and standing from here underneath the hood it kind of sounds like either the timing belt is like slapping inside of there or like rod knock um, so I told him what about your oil and he's like no I stay on top of my oil changes and blah 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 so I'm like let's just check it we pour it out the dipstick shows it's completely empty and he said his last oil change he did that one year oil slash like like uh, maximum oil filter stuff I told him dude do not give in to that one year oil life stuff change your normal regularly because look what happens uh, there's no oil in this thing if he damaged the bearings on a connecting rod If you're doing the brakes or the rear brakes on a 2004 Ford Mustang, you know, just got some new rotors. Uh, just finished sandblasting the caliper bracket here where the pads are gonna sit. It was the old stuff. You clearly see the pads aren't really making good contact. And these pads were on here for a while and they barely even look used. They look like they are playing a life in them. That just goes to show how they're not really doing their job despite being on the vehicle for so long. So we'll get this all taken care of today. I'm here on the right side of this Mustang now and clearly we have an issue. Seems like a bad axle seal. That's unfortunate because I'm not doing that. I'm just here for brakes. But uh, it sucks the new brakes are going to end up like this. Alright so <laughs> we're back again with the, the, the infamous PT Cruiser. <laughs> And uh, we got a wheel bearing issue, so that's what we're doing today. It was on the front left. Uh, we thought it was on the right side, but it, it was not. So I already got the old wheel bearing pressed out. Have a new one here. Just gonna go ahead and install it, and it should be all set. I'm in a 1999 Ford Explorer. And no, the key is not in the ignition, but it makes that noise. It's part of the reason why it's here. 
customer dropped off this list. I'll let you look at this. Now when I first got in the car, it was actually really difficult to get it out of park. It almost feels like you're going to break this right here. It's just super hard to just change it out of park or in any gear. You know, if you're in drive, it's hard to move it to neutral or second gear or reverse. It doesn't matter. Um, so he wants to change the ignition switch. But I'm going to have to look into this. I'm not sure it's the ignition switch. And there's a few other, you know, issues. You saw the list. So I got the covers on the steering column taken off. And someone's been in here because you can see electrical tape wrapped around the ignition cylinder. And for a split second, if I could get this camera right, for a split second while I was messing with it, the dinger actually turned off. Okay, see there it goes, it turned off. And it's back on. <laughs> so I've gone underneath the truck and actually disconnected the shift cable from the transmission. And it now moves very freely, very little effort. That tells me there's nothing wrong with the actual cable and all the resistance that he has, like where he has to fight this, um, is within the transmission. So the next issue is uh, the cigarette lighter. Here's the old one and basically it pushed all the way through. So if we put this in here, you can see how it just comes right through. Now sure this part is uh, worn out. But the housing itself, the plastic piece, is also worn out. So if we get a new one here, right here, you can see it doesn't quite go through, okay? It does stop right there. Um, this might be a temporary fix at best. Uh, that's assuming they don't push on it like crazy hard. But really, it needs a new uh, cigarette lighter as well as a new housing. Short update, even a new part, if uh, you tighten the back piece uh, good enough to try to get it snug, it ends up pulling right through. So not even that's going to work. I came up with a solution though, which I think is a solution. You can see I put an O-ring right here. And it's going to make that outer diameter just slightly larger. And the nice thing about this is it's not going to jump out at you. It's not going to stand out in any way. They probably won't even notice it. And yet, it's going to give it a nice, snug fit right there. Look at that. That is not going to get pulled through now. So let me go ahead and uh, tighten this up and let's see if it works. Pretty slick idea if you ask me. I'm going to have to patent this. <laughs> Finally getting back to this uh, Ford Explorer. Got the new cigarette lighter in. It works. And uh, this thing right here, it was uh, taped up here like I showed previously. And basically whenever this wire makes ground, whenever this wire makes ground or touches ground, it would cause the dinging sound. So all I did was took all that tape off and I put some uh, heat shrink around this wire so to make sure it doesn't come in contact with uh, anything metal and pretty much eliminate the whole dinging noise that's really annoying and uh, no harm done they could always cut the heat shrink off whenever they want it's just a cheap band-aid at this point at least the noise isn't there 24 7 and uh, annoying it's doing a uh, late night oil change the last job for tonight um, yeah sometimes oil changes don't go as planned now I gotta clean up my mess Gotta watch out for these coons out here. These raccoons, they will sneak up on you when you least expect it. Whoa! One of the final things I'm doing on this Ford Explorer is the blower motor. This thing is uh, completely shot. It's hard to do it one hand, but it's got so much play in the motor itself. And also the blower motor resistor, which is down here, 
because uh, it only works on high. Every other speed does nothing except for when you kick it into uh, full speed and then blower motor kicks in and when it finally turns on it sounds like crap. So we're going to get both of them replaced. And after this I'm done with this Explorer and the owner can come pick it up. And this Ford Explorer is all set. Blower motor works just fine. Sounds good, nice and quiet. AC on this bad boy still works. And that's it. Owner can come pick it up. So I'm just getting an oil change done on my Nissan. It's funny because I went to AutoZone and the, the kid at AutoZone was like, how many miles are on your car? I was like 25,000. He's like, on a 2015? They go, then, then you shouldn't use high mileage oil. I'm like, okay, good, because I'm not. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, you need a uh, conventional oil. I'm like, no, I've been using uh, synthetic since day one, so I'm just going to stick with it. And then uh, he's like, well, here it's, it says, on the computer, it says that you should use conventional. I'm like, I really don't care what the computer says. <laughs> like, I've been using synthetic since day one, and I'm going to continue to use synthetic. Today we have a Chevy Traverse, just doing the front brake pads. And the customer really got their money's worth out of it. <laughs> Gotta take them for everything they got. All right, so I am underneath a Dodge Caliber and it needs lower ball joints. But another issue, if we look back here at the bushing for the control arm, Jesus Christ, I'm like a rookie. Alright, so back there you can see the bushing starting to come out. And if I get my pry bar and I start prying on it, you can see more and more of the bushing starts to come out. So uh, instead of just uh, messing with a lower ball joint right here, it's just best to uh, replace the whole control arm. Now that I got the wheel off, you can get a pretty good look at this bushing on the control arm. see that uh, it's separated inside of there. I'm just here changing the serpentine belt. Alright, so I just came down here. I pulled, uh, you know, all the bags off of the engine. And I got something that's kind of concerning me, which is uh, rust developing on the inside of the engine. The engine's been sitting for a while and it's going to be sitting much longer because I don't have any plans of putting in a car right now. In fact, I don't even have a car to put in. So it's safe to assume it's going to be sitting for maybe a few years. Uh, obviously, there's no fluids in it. There's no oils. But I'm like, I'm not really sure what to think, whether rust is going to start to develop on the inside of the engine because there's no oil. So what do you guys think? Should I put oil in it? Should I not put oil in it? Will it be okay if I just keep it covered up like this? Or should I put oil in it? And like occasionally, I know it's not going to do much, but like occasionally come down here and try to rotate the engine by hand just to kind of get the oil moving. And then once in a while, come out here, drain the oil out and refill it. I've owned my car for about three years. I'm at about 26,000 miles. And today I just gave it its first car wash. I know it's kind of sad, but uh, those miles per gallon don't care if it's dirty or clean. <laughs> it's looking good, Nissan Versa. Alright, so today I'm just getting the brakes done on this, uh, I think it's a Malibu Impala, I don't know, it's all the same crap, right? Um, it's a little story that goes on with this car. Okay, so this car had been sitting for months, right? And what happens to brakes when they've been sitting for months? The rotors develop all kinds of rust, the pads get seized in place, right? So the first day that they start driving it, they hear weird, a weird noise coming from the brakes. So what do they do? They take it to a shop. And the shop sees all this rust on the rotors, right? So the first thing that comes to their mind is, hey, your calipers aren't working, they're seized. It's why all your rotors are rusty. So they quote them like over like $700 for like the labor and parts and replace calipers and all kinds of crap, right? Which I don't blame them. The thing is, the owner failed to tell them what was going on with the car. 
So they never told the shop that the car had been sitting for months and that day was the first day that they were driving it. Because once someone tells me that, first thing I say is, don't worry about the rust on the rotors then at this point, drive it for a few days and then we could see the condition of the rotors and see what they look like. So they brought it here and I told them, you know what, drive it around and this is what the rotor looks like after a few days of driving, okay? But the point is, the point is it was important to drive the car around and see what's going on. So for right now, we're gonna do the front brakes, the rear brakes, we're gonna hold off on any calipers. After the brakes are done and everything's been uh, re-greased and lubricated, then we're gonna drive it around, see what happens, and from, from there we can tell if it needs a new caliper or calipers. This is my first time using a fluid film and it just looks like a bunch of snot. Uh, excuse me all right back to the ghetto hoopty chronicles <laughs> someone on my last video just left that in the comments and i just thought it was funny as hell um and yeah it is kind of appropriate anyway uh you can see i'm just about done on this side and only three more wheels to do Ooh, she got them 20s all right now i'm just they're only 16s but she keeps them clean though And here's the situation with the rear brakes. At this point, it's still too early to tell if the caliper is no good because it could simply be just seized pads. If the pads are seized in place and they don't want to move, then it's going to act as if the caliper isn't working, more or less. So let's get in here and find out I'm out of breath <laughs> because I had to bang on this wheel to get it off. It was completely rusted in place. In case you were wondering, yes, the pads are seized in place. Uh, the piston on the caliper went in just fine without any problems. So, uh, yeah, it's not looking like we have bad calipers here. Just gonna go ahead and knock this rotor off and keep going forward. It's about 8.30 at night and I got one more job. It's just gonna be the last one for tonight. It's a Chevy Cobalt and we are replacing the alternator. It's not too bad of a job. Alternator sits right here. Just gonna have to move the radiator hose. Uh, the biggest thing I found to be a pain in the butt is getting the tensioner loose so you could remove the belt. And there really isn't much space here. So I ended up having to remove the engine mount that goes right here just to get to the tensioner. So that's kind of a shit design. But once you get that mount out and the belt is loose, alternator just comes right out. So it's overall not too bad of a job. And uh, customer got in the zone, auto zone. So I'm all done working on the Chevy Cobalt. Let's go ahead and check it. And there we go. As you can see, the alternator is charging at 14.3 volts. So pretty much done here. Everything's put back together. I know it seems pointless or a waste of time to record things like this, but recently I had a situation where I was able to pull up the footage and show the the customer hey after I was done with the alternator your car was charging just fine you know uh, sometimes it's just proof and that's about it